Today, I'm going to continue on our discussion of software architecture, diving into the first of the quality attributes we're going to talk about, sometimes referred to as non-fungible, non, non-functional requirements. Uh, and the first one is availability. And we start off uh, this uh, presentation with a quote by Jean-Michel, where he talks about the fact that technology does not always rhyme with perfection and reliability. Far from it in reality, you know, for anyone who's ever seen like the Windows blue screen or death or any other computer error, um, obviously systems can and will fail. Um, and so planning for those failures and how to recover from those failures is the topic of availability. So we're going to talk about our definition of availability. We'll go through a general scenario for our quality attribute availability, and then we'll talk about some architecture tactics to achieve availability, as well as a questionnaire and some pattern design patterns to help us achieve availability. So what is availability? Well, availability refers to a property of software that it's actually there and available and ready to carry out its task when you need the software system. Uh, availability includes the ability of a system to mask or repair faults so that they don't become failures. Uh, we have this sort of concept of the idea that a fault is something that goes wrong and it's a failure when users notice that it went wrong. And so if you can have your system automatically repair those faults before the user never even no ever notices it, then you avoid failures. And we also talk about the fact that availability is related to reliability by including the notion of recovery or repair. And we wanna minimize our service outage time. And that's really gonna be our measurement uh, for whether or not we're achieving a quality attribute of availability is our measurement of how much time that system is unavailable. And in terms of measuring, uh, how we're going to measure is we're going to measure the time when the, when the failure is observable. And so, you know, for example, if you come up with a workaround, even though you didn't fix the problem, but you're now working around it and, you, and the system appears to be working, then that's okay. That's good enough. So faults can be caused by lots of different things. Uh, faults can be internal or external to the system, you know, um, the faults can also be prevented or they can be tolerated if you can work around it. Um, you can forecast certain faults and have plans for working around them in the future. And basically, you know, we say when we're, our system is capable of handling these faults, that it's resilient to the faults or resistant to faults. And so from an availability perspective, we're going to be concerned with how faults are detected, how frequently they occur, what happens when the fault occurs, how long the system can be out of operation, how to prevent faults and failures, and what notifications are required when uh, a fault or a failure occurs. Now, some there's a lot you know, for each of these quality attributes, whether we're talking about availability or security or performance or any of the other quality attributes, there's often a term and a, a vocabulary and set of terms that are used in with regards to that particular quality attribute. Uh, with regards to availability, two of the most common terms you might see are the acronyms MD, MTBF and MTTTR. Uh, MTBF is a mean time between failures and MT, mean, MTTTR is a mean time to repair. And so one way to calculate availability is to use it as a numerical fraction where it's mean time between failures divided by mean time between failures plus mean time to re repair. So that's one way to calculate measures like, um, you know, whether or not you're achieving service level agreements of nine of uh, four nines availability. Another way to, uh, and if you think about it, really, what is MTBF and MTTTR? Well, that's the entire time period. And so not, and MTBF is the time between failures. Um, and so you can basically, another way to look at that is MTBF is the uptime. It's the time when there isn't a failure 
and the time below it is all the time. So for example, if, you know, one way to look at this, let's say your system was down for one day out of the year, then you would say MTBF uh, would be 364 days because you were up for 364 days. And then you're, you're, that's your numerator and your denominator is going to be 365. And so you'd take 364, divide it by 365, and you'd get something like 99.7% availability. And so if your goal was four nines availability, your 99.7 would fail it. But if your goal was only 99%, then you achieved it. And so that's how we determine whether or not we achieve the quality attribute of availability. So here's some examples of how much downtime you could actually have and still achieve a particular uh, system level agreement. So for example, if your requirement is 99% availability, you can have 21 hours of downtime every three months, or in a year you could have three, day, three and a half days. Now, on the other hand though, if you've got a four nines requirement, 99.99%, then in one year you can have less than an hour of downtime. And if you've got a six nines requirement in one year, you can have only 32 seconds of downtime. So that gives you an idea that, you know, if you're going now, one thing that keep in mind is that planned downtime is not usually considered in these computations. So it's really unplanned downtime. So if I plan to do an upgrade on my system and I'm going to take it down this weekend for a certain period of time, then that doesn't count against my service level agreement. But if the system, you know, crashes for some reason and it wasn't planned to be down, then all of that time does count against the availability measurement. So here's a look at our availability general scenario. Again, we're following this sort of formula of the source, the stimulus, uh, the response, response measurement, the artifact environment, and so on. So again, our source is going to be whatever causes the problem, and our stimulus is going to be the problem, the fault or the, or the failure. And a response is how we're going to handle that fault or failure. You know, maybe, we, or maybe we're going to prevent the fault from causing a failure. Maybe we're going to log the fault. Maybe we're going to notify system admin, admins, you know, disable the source of whatever's causing the problem, fix it or come up with a workaround, repair it. And our response measurement is going to be the time uh, in which the system wasn't available and what percentage that is of, you know, the time that it was available. And then we, you know, for example, compute a, a 99 point whatever based on the time the system was down. So for example, we've got a concrete scenario where a server fails and the system informs the operator and continues to operate uh, because they have a backup. So here's an example of our diagram for measuring the availability response time, you know, and determining if there's any downtime and how that impacts your service level agreements. All right, so let's talk about design tactics for availability. So as I mentioned earlier, a failure is when the system isn't, uh, is, has a problem that's observable by uh, the users of the system. A fault is there's a problem, but it hasn't actually risen to the level of failure yet. And so availability tactics are all about enabling the system to endure faults so that a fault doesn't become a failure. You know, we know that things are gonna go wrong. We know that our system is gonna suffer from faults. Our goal is to make sure that those faults don't rise to the failure level and observable by users and try to keep the effects of the fault to a minimum possible and make repair as easy as possible to do. Um, and so basically, you know, if you think about it, we've got a fault coming in, we've got architecture tactics to handle our response to that fault, and hopefully the fault's going to be masked and we'll have a workaround, or we prevent the fault, or we repair the fault, and so on, to minimize any possible failure of the system, as far as the users are concerned. So here's a diagram showing all the different availability tactics we've identified to help us achieve uh, availability in our software architecture. And there's really, in this diagram, we've got three main categories, a uh, detection of faults category, a recovery from faults category, and a preventing faults category. 
all of which are under this general category of availability tactics. Now, recover from faults is actually split up into two subgroups, a preparation and repair group and a reintroduction group. So before I dive into the uh, specific tactics and what they do, let's think about uh, these categories and how they probably operate. So detection faults is going to be about detecting the health of our systems on our servers and determining uh, whether or not there's a fault going on. So this is going to be things like monitoring the system, you know, communicating with the system to see if it's still up, checking conditions of components and stuff like that. Uh, preparation or repair is going to be stuff like um, what we do ahead of time, preparation, like having backup servers in place, um, doing some upgrades, repairs is things like reconfiguring a system. Um, you know, reintroduction is when we take a failed system, we bring it back in. Um, and then preventing faults is what can we do to prevent faults in our software? Um, all right, so those are our general categories. So let's take a look at some of the specifics of these different architecture tactics. And we're going to start with the architecture tactics for detecting faults. So we've got our series of architecture tactics here for detecting faults. The very first architecture tactic is ping and echo. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with ping and echo. This, you know, this is often done at the TCP IP level. You send a ping across the internet to another server. That machine then sends a response back. And assuming you receive the response back, you know that that system is up and running and it was capable of sending a response back. Um, if for whatever reason that system did not send a, a, a response back, then you might know, then it's possible the system's not up, it's possible there's something problem with the network, but you now know that there's some problem with the network or with the re receiving system. Um, if you were able to communicate to that system, then you now know that you were able to reach that system and exactly how long it took. Um, monitor is another architecture tactic for detecting, uh, for detecting faults. Uh, it's a component used to monitor the state of health of other components in the system. Uh, monitors can detect failure, congestion in the network, um, or other impacts on the system, such as denial of service attacks and so on. Um, a heartbeat is a message exchange between a monitor and a process being monitored. So in fact, if you're using a monitor, you may very well be using a heartbeat. You don't have to, you could be doing other approaches to monitoring, but the, and the heartbeat is kind of similar to the ping echo idea where you're sending messages off and you're receiving back, yes, we're still alive. Another uh, approach to detecting faults is to use a timestamp. This is often used to detect incorrect sequences and messages and events. Um, where you look to see that all the messages were in the proper order. Um, and you can also use timestamps to see if someone's manipulating or attacking the system and delaying messages. For example, a man in the middle attack can often be exposed using timestamps. So there are some security aspects for using timestamps. Sanity checking checks the validity or reasonableness of a component's operations or outputs typically based on a knowledge of the internal design, the state of the system, or the nature of the information under scrutiny. Condition monitoring, you know, checking conditions in a process or device, or validating assumptions made during the design. Voting, to check that replicated components are producing the same results. Comes in a variety of flavors, replication, functional redundancy, analytic redundancy. Exception detection, detection of a system condition that alters the normal flow of execution, for example, system exceptions, parameter fences, parameter typing, timeouts, and so, so forth. Um, and our final detecting faults is a self-test where the component can test itself for correct operation. Um, now, of course, if your component is having problems, then you may not trust the self-test, which is why people often use a separate system monitor, as we saw earlier. Um, a couple other comments about voting. 
Um, this is often used when you've got um, several components in parallel and you're checking to see if they all reach the same result. And there's a couple different approaches. Uh, replication is an approach where they're all identical. Um, functional redundancy is where they, you know, more or less functionally redundant, but they're not identical. And then analytic redundancy, they can be, you know, even more different. Um, all right, so those were all of our architecture tactics for detecting faults. Our second group of architecture tactics in the availability area is dealing with recovery from faults. And the first group of the recovery from faults are preparation and repair. And so perhaps the most popular architecture tactic for dealing with achieving availability is redundancy. And so we're actually gonna take a look at several different redundancy architecture tactics. And the first one we're gonna look at is the redundant sphere. Uh, this tactic refers to a, a configuration in which one or more duplicate components can step in and take over the work if the primary component fails. Um, and we've got several different uh, approaches to the redundant spare. We've got the hot spare, the warm spare, and the cold spare, which differ primarily in how up to date the back, backup component is at the time of its takeover. So, for example, the hot spare, uh, you've got two components that are both active. Uh, the cold spare, you've got one component that's turned off. It's cold. And when the primary fails, then you have to boot up the, uh, the backup. And the warm spare uh, is up and running, but it's not in sync with the hot spare. So it needs to uh, you know, catch up a little bit when it's taken over. Um, and so the primary difference between those three tactics is how expensive they are. The hot spare is going to be give you the best of highest availability, but it's also gonna be the most expensive. Cold spare gives you the lowest availability, but it's also the cheapest. And the warm spare is in between the two. All right, some of the other recovery from faults architecture tactics, uh, exception handling, you know, dealing with the exception by reporting it or handling it, uh, perhaps masking the fault by correcting the cause of the exception and retrying, you know, pushing the button again to see if it'll work the second time. Um, rollback was often used in databases. Uh, the idea is, you know, you're rolling back to a previously known good state, uh, also used in transaction processing quite a bit. Uh, software upgrade, you know, you know, basically make it, make an upgrade to your software, taking the system down and, you know, going ahead and doing the upgrade. Retry, you know, many cases, uh, whatever caused the failure, might only be temporary. So if you try it again, maybe it'll work. Um, ignoring the faulty behavior. Sometimes you can just ignore error messages and keep on going. Uh, graceful degradation, you know, maintaining the most critical system functions and dropping stuff that uh, you don't really care about, you know, when there are failures. And reconfiguration, you know, if some resources are functioning and other resources aren't functioning, then reassign responsibilities and keep the system going while maintaining as much functionality as possible. All right, so our next category of architecture tactics inside recovery from faults is reintroduction. So these are tactics for introducing a failed system back into our environment. So the first of these tactics is called shadow. You know, operating a previously failed or upgraded component in a shadow mode for some amount of time prior to reverting the component back to an active role. So for example, um, if I had a system fail, you know, I repair it, then I bring it back in. When I'm gonna start running again, I don't just immediately uh, make it active, but I watch it for a while and make sure I'm comfortable with it before I, I, I make it fully active. Uh, state resynchronization is an architecture tactic, uh, which is often used with active redundancy uh, where I'm trying to uh, ensure that the state information is sent from the active component to the standby component. So the standby component has all the information it needs uh, to take over. Escalating restart 
is about recovering from faults by varying what components you actually restart. So for example, let's say I had a problem with my system. Um, I could reboot the entire computer, but maybe I don't need to. Uh, maybe I just need to reboot uh, one particular software component, or maybe I need to reboot all of the software components. And so you could say you might have like three levels of reboot. Re level one is just reboot one component. Level two is reboot everything, all the software components. And level three is also re reboot the hardware and the network and so on. So, you know, levels in what you might want to restart. Uh, Nonstop forwarding is often used with routing. Um, you know, basically it's a way of recovering uh, along from routers. Um, and I'm not gonna go into it in much more detail than that. All right, so let's talk about uh, our next architecture category for availability, which is preventing faults. So this is, you know, as we're ahead of time, we know that our system will fail. So let's try and minimize those faults as much as possible. So the first way of first architecture tactic is uh, removal from service. You know, temporarily place a system component out of service state for the purpose of mitigating potential system failures. Well, why would we take the system out of service? Don't we want to use it? Well, you might take it out of service if you're planning to do an upgrade or if you know your system has been running for a really long time. Uh, for example, in uh, one of the Gulf Wars, the uh, US military uh, put a Patriot missile battery, uh, I think this is a 1990 Gulf War, uh, put a Patriot missile battery in Israel to knock down Scud missiles. Um, but the Patriot missile battery that they put there was intended to only be running for about 24 hours and then you would reboot the system. The assumption was you would be rebooting the system every day. Well, during the Gulf War, they were so worried about incoming Scud missiles that they did not reboot the system uh, for several days. The problem was there was a memory leak. And while when you rebooted the system every day, that memory leak went away and you covered all the memory. But by not, when they decided not to reboot the system for several days, the memory leak got larger and larger. And so eventually the system failed when, uh, due to the memory leak. So this is a so if they had just followed the removal from service approach and actually rebooted their system every day, they would have avoided that potential system failure. Um, and that's another example of a software failure that could potentially have led to a loss of life. Now, in this case, I don't think it did, but you know, if a more dangerous missile had come by during the system failure, then it could have led to a loss of life. Um, let's talk about transactions management. Transactions management is a very common design pattern for dealing with financial data and other important information. The basic idea is when you have uh, a transaction that is doing multiple state updates uh, and you want all those updates to be uh, done as a bundle and updated together, uh, we can apply these transaction properties to ensure that the transaction updates go forward as a group or they don't go forward. And so our four properties that refer to transactions processing are atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable, sometimes referred to as the ACID acronym. Uh, atomic means that it's a transaction and it's all going to go through um, as one transaction. Consistent means that the state of the system is going to be consistent um, you know before and after durable means that we're going to save that state and isolated means that this transaction isn't going to affect other transactions um, and so we often see transactions in databases for example if you've ever heard about database rows being locked while while something is being updated that's an example of transactions uh, another example of transactions, perhaps the classic example of transactions is uh, imagine, for example, you and your spouse both use uh, an ATM machine and you're both on opposite sides of town and you're both withdrawing money from the ATM simultaneously from the same bank account. Well, the bank will lock one of those ATMs 
and only allow one of you to withdraw money at a time. And then when the next person is withdrawing money, you'll see the, the updated balance for what your spouse has already withdrawn the money. Um, and so that's one place where transactions are used to ensure that two people can't do simultaneous transactions on the bank that could potentially interfere with each other. Another example of an architecture tactic for preventing faults is a predictive model, where we monitor the state of the health of a process to ensure the system is operating with, uh, within normal parameters, and we take corrective action when conditions are detected that are predictive of likely future faults. Uh, and in fact, you may have heard of this concept in the context of something referred called uh, condition-based maintenance. The idea where, for example, in your car, you might see a light pop up saying your car needs service soon. And that's actually coming not based on the, 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 uh, the system in a car doesn't really know whether your system needs maintenance. It's predicting that there's been so many miles since your last maintenance that you probably do need maintenance. So it's more based on how much wear and tear has been on the car than it does on whether or not your actual components need maintenance. It's a prediction. Uh, that's why we call it a predictive model. Exception prevention um, is another architecture tactic for preventing faults. You know, here we're going to prevent system exceptions from occurring by hiding the faults or preventing it by using various wrappers and things. Um, and so basically this is, again, we don't want a failure to be observable by the user to the extent that we can, we're gonna have the system itself handle the problems. Uh, the final architecture tactic for preventing faults is increasing the competence set. Here, what we're talking about is designing a component to handle more cases or faults as part of its normal operation. So let me give you an example of that. Um, you know, if you attempt to do a, use a calculator and divide by zero, you should get an error message because division by zero is not supported by our mathematics. Um, and in fact, um, if you write a computer program and you attempt to divide by zero, you'll probably generate an exception uh, because they're saying, hey, there's been a math error here. Well, one thing you can do when you're creating your software program that's doing division and you're passing in a numerator and denominator, you could test the denominator to verify that it's not zero before you attempt the division. And so, you know, if someone passes in a, a denominator that's zero, then you can just kind of say, hey, please send me another denominator. That one won't work. And you can avoid causing an exception and a, a, because an exception becomes a fault. And so increasing the competence in a set is really just checking the information being passed in to ensure that it's not going to generate exception by doing something like trying to divide by zero. All right, so this next part of this presentation is just to go through a quick tactic space questionnaire for availability. So why would you even want or care about this questionnaire for availability? Well, if you're a software architect and you've been given um, a system and your stakeholders have told you that availability is important to them, then you might ask yourself some questions for the architecture to determine whether or not the system already has capabilities uh, to achieve availability. Or, and if it doesn't have those capabilities to achieve availability, uh, if you should bring those capabilities in. So for example, the very first question here is, is our system currently using ping echo to detect failure of a component or connection between components or network connect congestion? Um, and then we go through pretty much a series of questions diving into each of those architecture tactics we talked about. So in addition to like ping echo, we talk about monitoring the health of the system. Uh, are we using a heartbeat to detect failure of a component? Are we using a timestamp to detect uh, um, whether messages are being arriving in an incorrect sequence? Are we using voting to check that replication, replicated components are producing the same result? Um, are we using exception detection to detect uh, conditions uh, that are altering the normal flow of ex execution and so on? Uh, from a recovering from faults perspective, we can ask, you know, do we have single points of failure, failure or do we have redundancy? 
Uh, do we have ways of handling exception handling? Uh, do we have, are we using rollbacks? Or, uh, are we doing retries when something fails? Uh, and, and so on. We can go through each of these questions and ask ourselves whether or not our system is currently doing this, as well as do we want to do this? And so this is really uh, a questionnaire the architecture architects would ask themselves while they're looking at their current system architecture. Uh, furthermore, when they're re you know recovering from faults, they can ask themselves, do they plan to let new si systems come back in uh, in a shadow mode? Are they going to use state resynchronization? Uh, for their backup components. And from a preventing faults perspective, are they going to use transactions management? Are they going to use a predictive model? And so on. Basically, you know, a series of questionnaire based questions for all of the different architecture tactics we talked about. Um, there's also a number of design patterns, which I've kind of briefly referred to in the past, but I'm going to go into a little more detail now. Um, these pat design patterns are often used within systems that are attempting to achieve high availability. Um, as I mentioned, uh, redundancy is a very popular design pattern to avoid single points of failure to achieve high availability. Uh, active redundancy or the hot spare is referring to a configuration in which all the nodes in the group are receiving and processing identical inputs. So you've got two servers in a group, they're all receiving the same input and they're processing it simultaneously. If one server goes down, the other one is up to date because that server has been processing all the information and it's ready to keep on going. Um, and so you can have, if you're using this active redundancy approach, uh, the backup server can take over from the primary server in a matter of milliseconds because uh, you don't need much to uh, update it because it's been kept synchron synchronously and, up and updated all along. The warm spare, however, needs to have, um, you know, is not actively processing all the inputs. Instead, it's receiving periodic state updates. And so it's, uh, it will need a little bit of synchronization time when it takes over, but it's still running actively. And it's, I mean, it's still running online. And so it's faster than the cold spare. So it's not as expensive as the active active approach, but it's, you know, it, it's sort of in the middle between the active active and the cold spare. The cold spare is when the, 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 the backup server is, is off. And so we've got to turn it on. We've got to bring it up to speed. We've got to synchronize it. Uh, and so if you have high availability requirements like multiple 999.99 or whatever, I would not recommend the cold spare um, just because of the amount of time it takes to power on the computer. Uh, but in general, the benefits of having redundancy is that the system can continue to function after only a brief delay with the length of delay being based on whether you're, you're the hot spare, the warm or the cold. Um, if you don't have redundancy, then your system could stop functioning correctly or altogether until the failed components repaired, which could take multiple days. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's really a trade-off with these different uh, redundancy design patterns, depending on, and which is really a trade-off in terms of cost, complexity, uh, bandwidth, and so on. And it's really uh, the trade-off is the time to recover from a failure versus the cost incurred to keep the spare up to date with the hot spare carrying the highest costs, but also providing the fastest recovery time. Another design pattern is the uh, TMR pattern for availability, which is used in the voting tactic, where we have three components that are then voting on what the actual result will be. Um, and so there's a couple different approaches to this. One approach is to say, hey, look, if all three components uh, do not agree, then we pour a fault. Um, but then also you have to decide if they don't agree, what are you going to do? Are you going to allow a majority to rule? Are you going to reject everything? Or are you going to go with an average of the results? Um, there's a couple different approaches for how to implement that. Um, the advantage of using the voting approach is that the odds of two or more components failing is very, very small. And so usually if you rely on two out of three, you're going to be doing very well. 
Another design pattern for availability, it's a circuit breaker design pattern. Um, you know, it's kind of similar to retry, you know, in the event of something failing and we retry and we retry again. The circuit breaker, however, is designed to prevent you from retrying too many times. So like you might retry three times and then we'll stop. Um, until at some point you reset the circuit breaker and then you can start retrying again. So the benefits from this is it removes from individual components the policy about how many retries to allow. Um, you know, because in you know in some cases you might have individual components uh, trying who knows how many times. You have to be a little careful though when you uh, decide that there can only be so many retries. Uh, if so, you have to be a little careful in determining how many. You don't want it to be too small. But you don't want it to be too high. Uh, and this is kind of similar to selecting timeouts. You don't want a timeout to be too long uh, because you get too much latency added. But if it's timeouts too short, then that's then you could leave before um, you know the system would actually work. There are a number of other availability design patterns out there: uh, process pairs, forward error recovery, and many others. Um, you could have an entire course on design patterns, so we're not going to go through all these. Uh, but I'll just mention a couple of these real quick. Process pairs employs checkpoints and rollbacks. So in case of a failure, the backup has been checkpointed and rolls back to a safe state. As this is often used for redundancy in transaction processing and so on. Uh, forward error recovery basically um, provides a way to get out of an undesirable state by moving forward to a desirable state. Um, and it often relies on built-in error correction capabilities with data redundancy, so that errors can be corrected without the need to fail back to a previous state. Uh, so this was a brief lecture on the quality attribute of availability. Availability is all about um, whether or not our system's actually available for use uh, when the user needs it, or whether a fault or an error is preventing the user from being able to use the system. Um, and so from an architecture perspective, we, our system needs to be able to recognize a fault and the, or prevent it. Uh, and if the system wasn't able to prevent it, then it needs to be able to respond to that fault and fix the problem. Uh, we talked about a number of different architecture tactics for handling faults and dealing with faults. Uh, the three main categories was uh, detecting faults, recovering from faults, and preventing faults. Detection tactics depend on detecting signs of life from components. Uh, recovery tactics are things about like having redundant systems or retrying an operation. And prevention tactics depend on removing elements of service or limiting the scope of faults. You know, I gave you the example of increasing the competence set where we, uh, you know, plan ahead to hopefully prevent faults from happening. So this has been a brief lecture on software availability. I want to thank everyone for attending this lecture on software availability and tune in next time when I dive deeper in to software architecture.